here? I have uh, Hanu strip one. Oh my god, you're really using Hanu beef for I us? I am Hanu, look at that. The marbling on it. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, amazing. right? Just like the movie. Just like the movie. Hi, and welcome to Eat Drink Asia. I'm Alkira Reinfrank. And I'm Bernice Chan. Today, we're looking into a dish that you've either never heard of or you've seen made in this film. Japaguri, or Ramdon, as you may know from the Academy Award winning movie Parasite, is a super easy and cheap dish that simply mixes up two kinds of instant noodles together. So you have japagetti, which is a Chinese Korean dish made with black bean sauce, and noguri, which is a brand of seafood flavored ramen. Thanks to the Korean film by Bong Joon Ho, japaguri became well known worldwide. In the film, the rich wife, Mrs. Park, asks the housekeeper to make ramdon using instant noodles and the Korean equivalent of Wagyu beef, shocking Korean audiences. It would be like taking boxed macaroni and cheese and throwing a lobster tail on top. It's so outrageous, but it's also so delicious. We didn't know it until we tried it. <laughs> oh my gosh, the beef. Mm. <laughs> my love beef is so good. It tastes as good as it looks. This is Eat Drink Asia, where in each episode we deep dive into an Asian food or drink that's gone global. Stay with us. And the Oscar goes to... Parasite. So unless you've been living under a rock, History was made this year when Parasite won four Oscars. It was the first non-English language film in the Academy's history to win Best Picture. The black comedy thriller also won top prize at the Cannes Film Festival and two BAFTAs. So it's safe to say this Korean film made a huge splash in the West for an Asian movie. But it wasn't just the film that was the winner. A dish only known to Koreans quickly became something global audiences salivated over. Ramdon. So we want to talk to you about Ramdon. Ah, yes, Japaguri. This is Jennifer Flynn. She teaches at Kyung Hee University in Seoul. But in addition to my teaching and work there, I also do studies of food, particularly Korean food. So wait, is it Ramdon or Japaguri? Okay, I believe in the American translation they called it Ramdon, which is a portmanteau word with ramyeon and udon. Uh, but in Korean, it's uh, japaguri, which is a combination of two different instant noodles. So you have japageti, which is supposed to be jajangmyeon flavored noodles, which is a Chinese Korean dish made with black bean sauce, and noguri, which is a brand of seafood flavored ramen. So you would take these two ramen, you'd cook the noodles together, and then you'd add both sauce packets. You would drain the noodles first, and then you just add it to the soft, damp noodles and mix it up together. So you get sort of this thick sauce on top of the noodles. So call it a ramdon, which means ramen plus udon is actually not accurate. This is our producer, Yang Yang. No, if you listen to the actual Korean dialogue, they say japaguri. Uh, the translator, in this case, Darcy Parker, he made a very deliberate choice. They were worried that if they just translated it as japaguri, then audiences outside Korea wouldn't know what they were talking about. But they wanted to communicate that it was this combination of different noodles. So they went with some other Asian noodles that they thought that maybe international audiences might be more familiar with because the amount of screen real estate that you have to take up to explain japaguri, it would, you know, the whole screen would be writing. Here's a random fact for you. On average, a Korean person eats 74 packets of instant noodles annually, which makes them easily the biggest instant noodle consumer per capita in the world. So Koreans love eating instant noodles, but it comes to a point where even they get sick of eating the same flavor. That's where japaguri comes in. Initially, instant noodles were invented in Japan. 
Uh, but they came to Korea relatively quickly thereafter. By 1963, uh, Samyang Ramen, which is one of the main brands, has already got the technology and they're producing instant noodles. And it becomes a really big hit. No one really knows where this mixing of noodles comes from, but legend has it the military can take credit. There's some indication that Japa Guri might have started with guys who were in the army, because when Korean guys do their two years of military service, um, they don't have a, access to a lot of off-base food, but there's usually uh, a snack canteen where you can get these noodles. And it's a way of creating new flavors, doing something a little fun with your friends. And do you usually add beef to it? No, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, this is a dish that's really meant to be sort of snack food, student grub, something you're eating because you either don't have a lot of time or a lot of money. It's not something you'd ever put beef on, especially you wouldn't put really, really expensive beef like they do in this particular movie. Um, this is meant to be a sign of how outlandishly rich these people are and how out of touch they are sort of with how normal people eat. Usually you can get the noodles for less than two US dollars and the only other ingredient you need is boiling water. Mix it together with any leftovers in your fridge and you're done. In the movie, Mrs. Park asks the housekeeper, Mrs. Kim, to prepare japaguri for her son with hanu beef. Yong Soo Do, the executive chef at Silencio Restaurant in Hong Kong, helped us recreate this dish. So today we're going to use uh, one japaguri and one noguri. Uh, but some say the best ratio is two chapagetti and one noguri. That's a lot of carbs. It's a lot of carbs. So if you're eating alone, good luck. But if you're like, if you want, if you're trying to do a mukbang, like the the eating YouTube and live live show, then yeah, go for two chapagetti and one noguri and tons of haru. All right, so I'm gonna put the kombu first. Yeah. And then, like I said first, since the noguri ramen is a little bit thicker than chapaguri. Uh, Chapagetti. Oh, I'm, I'm getting my word confused. I'm gonna put the Nogri ramen first. Uh, meanwhile, while is that going, I'm gonna start cooking the steak. So nice hot pan. All right, so now we're gonna empty out the water. So you leave about, about a cup worth water left in your pot. So half, the reserve half pack of noguri powder and then the other, a full pack of yeah. And Then we're gonna turn on the heat. So yeah, so you're, you're basically cooking it again into the, in, a, in a pot. So you don't wanna cook the instant noodle too much and, and you don't wanna boil the noodle at first too much. Cause you kinda wanna braise it a little bit with the sauces so the noodle serves all the, the black bean sauces. So now we'll go to the plate. How much does the noodle cost you? I I think five. There was a five ramen each pack, and I bought two pack one one pack of each, and it cost me around seventy dollars. So seven per bag. Seven per bag, I guess. And how much is the hanu beef? <laughs> Just tell us. Hanu beef, it's it's about. $850 per kilo. It was $800, $850. To put things into perspective, we asked Jennifer for the Western equivalent. You know, there is kind of an equivalent. For a while, there was this uh, period where people were doing things like putting lobster and truffles on macaroni and cheese. This would be like doing lobster or truffle macaroni and cheese, but instead of having like homemade macaroni and cheese with good cheese in it, and then, you know, adding this... Ec it would be like taking boxed macaroni and cheese and throwing a lobster tail on top. You have to have a, a serious disregard for the meaning and value of the ingredients in order to do that. And that's why the scene was so shocking for Korean audiences to see. Premium beef is never eaten with instant noodles, but it does show the class difference between the two families in Parasite. And there's a couple of other scenes in Parasite that deal directly with food and class. One of the most important things is not something they eat, but something they talk about very explicitly. The poor family, the Kims, 
mention a couple of times how they lost their money from owning a franchise. So one thing that's very popular and very common in Korea is when people are forced into retirement, they don't necessarily have enough money to live on for the rest of their lives. So they go from moving, they work, they move from being in a company to opening their own restaurants or businesses. And these are really commonly things like uh, fried chicken franchises. Uh, Koreans really love fried chicken and there's a lot of fried chicken stores, but a lot of these sort of mom and pop chicken restaurants are run by people who've retired but need to continue having an income. So they invest in these uh, chicken restaurants and if they don't do well, of course, oftentimes people have lost their retirement savings. And although nowadays most people know Korean food as kimchi, military stew, and japaguri, which are dishes focused more on necessity than on gourmet cuisine, Jennifer says there's a big part of traditional Korean culinary culture from centuries ago that's missing in the bigger picture. So in particular, Korea used to have, in addition to regular food culture, it also had this very elevated food culture associated with the yangban, uh, the scholar literati, with uh, the palaces. But the problem is that this particular mode of food was essentially lost. We have written records, we have some very tenuous sort of people who remembered working in the palace a long time ago. Uh, and there's efforts to restore this culture, but there's very few direct links to this food culture. Uh, it was destroyed deliberately through colonization. And then in the post-war period, of course, we have a country that has been ravaged by war, that has been ravaged by colonization, and people's first concerns were not the preservation and restoration of uh, high-end cuisine. It was more about eating in general. So there's been a lot of damage to Korean cuisine through this history. Chef Yong, however, is grateful that Korean food has been catapulted into the mainstream thanks to Parasite. I think I, I believe so. I believe the, the Parasite was the point. We could, we could actually say the point before Parasite and after Parasite. From 10 years ago, my friends and, and even my teacher from my class, they didn't know where Korea existed. They thought that Korea was part of Japan or China. And now they, they, know, they know Ramdom. <laughs> from Korea uh, and they, they share this recipe online and it's, it's quite amusing to see that and, and you know I hopefully uh, hopefully this continues and, and you know people can find out about more different cultures and, and different recipes it's kind of like almost like helped to strengthen the Korean identity outside of Korea exactly yeah, yeah. It, it did it did and then it, it, it made me proud I, I left Korea when I was really really young and through the experience in my in a foreign country, I never felt like people really know Korea. It was just like small country in Asia, uh, but now it, everything's turned, and now they know Busan, Gwangju, even small cities, not just Seoul. It was building, just like wine. It was fermenting for a very very long time with K-pops and dramas, with food and everything. And Parasite just it just popped it. It opened the bottle. It's it's just popped it. So I'm very, very proud of the Parasite and, and Ramdam because nah, it's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so Akira, are you going to make japaguri at home now? I definitely think I will because I'm a terrible cook, but I think I can handle instant noodles, but I will not be using the expensive beef. <laughs> no, but that was what made the dish so good. So Bernice, Parasite was massive and is such an influential film. What do you think it's done for the Korean diaspora in the West? I think it was absolutely amazing. Like I saw a lot of Korean restaurants that are in LA and New York. They were all so thrilled that the film won. And some of them actually put the dish on their menu, charging like 20 US dollars for it. But some of them actually made their own noodles to go with it to justify that price. Okay, so would you pay for that? <laughs> Probably, if I had that craving. <laughs> this episode is produced and edited by Yang Yang, and we want to thank Yong Sudo and Jennifer Flynn. If you want to ask us about a dish or a drink, tweet us at Beijing Calling or at Alkira Ryan Frank. Eat Drink Asia is a monthly podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, happy eating! Happy eating!